Hello everybody. I promised earlier that I would do a review of Sabor's love letter to Dennis Noble, also known as his book, The Death of Modern Neo-Darwinism. He was thoroughly embarrassed on this subject when he tried to debate De Farina, and also when evolutionary biologists and science communicators exposed Dennis Noble for the ill-informed claims that he is making. Sabor's book has 108 pages, but 25 of them consist of religious quotes, the contents page, multiple blank pages, and the references at the back, so there are only 83 pages of actual information. Actual quotes from the book I will put in quotation marks. If we start off with a preface, Sabor starts by comparing his imagination of Richard Dawkins's position and contrasting him with Dennis Noble's approach. We've all seen recently how erroneous Dennis Noble's approach is, as well as the straw man misunderstanding of Richard Dawkins's position from his opponents. It's pertinent to note that the first word in Sabor's supposed science book is atheism. He then demonstrates his lack of understanding when he references Dawkins's book, The Selfish Gene, describing it as an individualist outlook, completely not understanding that what this is supposed to represent is the gene as the unit of selection, not that it promotes a nihilistic and materialistic view. He then makes the ridiculous claim that neo-Darwinism is the basis for Dawkins' advocacy for atheism. There are many reasons for not believing in a god. Neo-Darwinism is a good explanation for the apparent design in living systems and took away the design argument for God's existence. In his book, The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins lists other reasons for his atheism. He states that Dawkins is reluctant to engage with academic critics. This is wrong as Dawkins has engaged in debates, including the one with Dennis Noble that Sabor is fond of referencing. He has also responded to some critics in academic journals. In academia, discussion is through writing in scientific journals and conferences, not through debate contests. Sabor tried to further his point by noting how Dawkins was condescending to Hamza Sortsis, as if Hamza Sortsis is some sort of academic worthy of scientific discussion. He contrasts this with Dennis Noble's more open approach, perhaps not aware that Dennis Noble is trying to speak to as many people as possible as he's trying to put out a narrative funded by the Templeton Foundation, and that while Noble is a respected physiologist, Noble doesn't engage with evolutionary biologists. Why Dennis Noble is unequivocally not an evolutionary biologist. Um, I think to be an evolutionary biologist, and, and, and I want to be clear here, in effect, to be an evolutionary biologist, I think that you have to do one of three things. Um, you either have to have um, done some sort of work in the lab around evolutionary biology. So this is like you do experimental evolution, you do population genetics, you do phylogenetics, you do systematics, you do evolutionary ecology or behavioral ecology, right? Like there's some things that you research that are broadly considered within the realms of evolutionary biology. That's, that's point number one. Dennis Noble does none of those things. None of his research could fall under any of those categories. So that's, that's one issue. The second thing is that you publish in journals that specialize in evolution. And so what we mean by that is journals like Evolution, published by the Society for the Study of Evolution. You publish in the Journal of uh, Evolutionary Biology, in Genetics, in Molecular Biology and Evolution. There's a series of journals that evolutionary biologists publish in. Now, J Dennis Noble has a very long Google Scholar, but you can go through, and I've, I've tried to make sure I went through every single one before I made this claim. He has not published a single paper in any journal that could ever be considered a journal on evolution. Not a single one. So all of his papers are in like physiology journals, or they're in journals like Progress in Molecular Biology and Biophysics, in which is a crank journal, for one, they published that like cephalopods come from outer space, and two, that he was the chief editor of when he did most of the publishing, right? So like, that's point number two, why he's not an evolutionary biologist. And then the last one, every year, all evolution societies all around the world have conferences. 
And if you're an evolutionary biologist, you go to these conferences, you present your work to the community and you get critiqued from, of your work by, by the community. I have been to many of these. Never seen Dennis Noble there at any of them. Sabal then puts in this totally ridiculous sentence, accusing Dawkins of misunderstanding neo-Darwinism and seeking to eliminate morality. Richard Dawkins does advocate for morality, just a secular one. Sabal states that the aim of this book will be to critically examine neo-Darwinism while advocating for Dennis Noble. He then further highlights his ignorance by reiterating that atheism is a belief system solely based on a scientific theory. These are all the things that I have found wrong in just the two and a half page preface of his book. Moving on to chapter one, he gives a background into neo-Darwinism and Dennis Noble's claim that neo-Darwinism is dead. He sets the ground for his attack on neo-Darwinism by reminding us that while neo-Darwinism is not as unassailable as the heliocentric model, it is still a robust theory. He provides a quote from Richard Dawkins's book, The Devil's Chaplain. He intends to insert this chink to allow us to start doubting neo-Darwinism by admitting that neo-Darwinism is almost at the confidence level of the heliocentric model. He's setting himself up for failure unless he provides very convincing evidence. For any scientific theory to be regarded as almost at the level of the heliocentric theory is a testament to the high quality of the evidence behind it. That is really all that is said about chapter 1. Chapter 2 starts with an accurate description of the history of the development of neo-Darwinism, though he can't help but equate neo-Darwinism with religion, probably to lower science down to the level of religion and make it easier to attack. He stated the four pillars of neo-Darwinism and Noble's claims, just like he did in the opening statement of his debate, and he finishes the chapter with a laughable and stupid claim about neo-Darwinism being deceased. Chapter 3 starts off with Sabor starting to introduce Noble's doubts. Sabor demonstrates a misunderstanding of the central dogma. The one-way flow of information is due to the redundancy of the genetic code. What it actually means is that with more than one combination of codons to create an amino acid, it's impossible to work backwards to determine which combination. For example, if you look at the top left of this diagram, UUU and UUC both code for phenylalanine, which is shown here as PHE. Therefore, if you have a phenylalanine amino acid, you can't determine whether it was UUU or UUC that coded for it. There is this quote about agency and body and mind being distinct from our genes, which injects a form of dualism. I will put in the description an article as to why agency isn't a testable biological process and belongs in the realm of philosophy. Sabor then further highlights his misunderstanding by recounting from the initial discussion the analogy of preserving Dennis Noble's DNA and then creating an identical twin. I discussed this in another video, but the summary is that it won't be the same person, as identical twins don't have the same DNA due to mutations and environmental factors. He then mentions a paper from 1985 to support his claim that genetics can't predict causation, but the article only provided a mathematical model of cardiac cellular electrical activity. There is no mention of genetic buffering, as Sabor claims. This is the line from Sabor's book, where he claims that the experiment looked at genetic buffering. I got AI to review the article, just in case I had missed it, this is the result showing there was no mention of genetics. The rest of the chapter is just more repetition of the same mistakes and misunderstandings. I will end part one of this analysis and resume from chapter four of his book in another video. Thank you for watching and please let me know what you think in the comment section.